我们的圆桌讨论的议题，是大家相当感兴趣的生物科技和电子医疗的新趋势。然后我们有请到的四位圆桌嘉宾是 Singularity AI 的 CEO 李辉，瀚海 BioLab 的 CEO Ella Li， n e o s i d e 的 CEO 王涛，还有 Genius Technology 的 CTO 周耀洲，掌声有请他们。So I have two questions. First, how many of you have not have not have any uh, virtual visit to your doctors, or have home test, or not have any uh, online risk assessment of your health? Very healthy audience <laughs> over there. <laughs> and the rest of the audience, you all have the experience of digital health and tele uh, telemedicine. My second question is how many of you have not complained about how slow the COVID diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccine that hit the market? Not complain. Very embarrassing to, uh, to, uh, to me like, like in the industry as uh, um, for the healthcare and uh, therapeutics. But I think that the two major trends I want to summary. The first is that we want to move to patient-centric. That means that means we move to patients, care about individuals, let it be telemedicine, or we even talk about decentralization of clinical trials and all the cares. And the second trend is to accelerate, accelerate the whole industry to increase the productivity of therapeutics, diagnostics, and everything. So with this trend, I have uh, several questions to our uh, to our panelists. And first, since we're talking about therapeutic productivity, I have questions for um, for Tao. That is, their company is working on CNS drugs, meaning drugs for brain, for spinal cord, very essential diseases like a lot of people suffer. And this is really tough, tough area. Just give a, a general audience an idea how tough it is. So in, um, in our industry, we're talking about for an average drug, it takes 10 years and $1 billion, and the success rate is as low as 10% to uh, for drug to successfully uh, clinical trials. And for CNS drugs, unfortunately, it takes way longer, and the success rate is way lower, and in some special disease, it's almost zero. And he chose such an area to work on. Could you tell us why? <laughs> and how actually you change, actually change the uh, low productivity over there? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Wei Tang. Thank you for the from this way. Yeah. Uh, so on this side, we, we work on this uh, disease areas and your science. As we mentioned, you know, uh, I think actually with numbers data, right now for the new drug discovery uh, in the last report, the latest by take more than ten years, like twelve years, twelve to fourteen years for new drug, and the cost I think uh, we cited that was about ten years ago is a billion dollar. The latest I saw number is like 2.4 billion dollars on average. Because each year there's like 30 to 40 new drugs in the US, and then you think about how much money we spend on that, that's the number. But for each drug, if you know successfully, it's not to be just half million, half billion is the cost. And CS yeah, you know, the biggest, you know, probably for uh, area we know the highest failure rate is uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, 
there's you know, one drug approved last year, you know, I think the sales less than a million a year, basically it's not going to use it. And in China, there's another drug, you know, and you know, I don't comment. So basically in 20 years, we don't have any new drugs, um, Alzheimer's disease, even when we spend billions, billions of dollars on it. Uh, so the reason, you know, as we mentioned, it is more hard is why we go into it. I think, you know, when you start business, you want to you know, go to a tough area because that's where challenge is, and there's less competition. And if you find a way, you think you have a solution, I think that's where the real business is. And then, um, which you think is because, you know, if you think of why people are failed in this area, I think you know, people mostly know the reason. One is the new science, the research, is way behind compared to like, oncology. Right, you know, we know all the pathways, you know, even 20 years ago, all the genes, oncogene, those things. But new science, I think, it just started, you know, very recently. And if we like, look at the history, right now the new science is probably what we were in 20 years ago, in the beginning of genomics area. You know, that's, you know, pushed a lot in, the, in oncology, so that's one. And secondly is because, you know, if you understand, you know, the drug process for, you know, I think most of you know, you know, we do clinical study, go to clinical trials. And uh, the decision on which drug are taking clinic is based on the, the animal test, right? You, you try to, you know, test the drug, working mouse and mouse. And then, you know, we know how different human and mouse are, right? And then, you know, uh, we can't really translate the data from the mouse and human. So that's why. So the joke is, you know, we can treat almost every disease in mouse, but we can't treat human. I think the reason. And for us, is I think that's the problem. Then uh, one part solution is, you know, you know, we can't use human to do trial, right? It's a clinical trial. We can't experiment human. And the mouse is is, is not a good model. Then we, we, we try somewhere in the middle. Basically, we use human neurons. We can produce in, in which of large quality and going in the in the, in the patch to use it to, to model the human brain. So therefore, you know, the data we get from this artificial brain dish will be more close to the human. So that's the solution. So that's why we think we have kind of you know possible solution to, to this problem. There's a lot of answer no question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, and um, actually, um, when people talk about to, to increase the productivity of uh, drug discoveries, there's a trend of AI that claims basically accelerate uh, and shorten the uh, drug discoveries, cutting her even one third. And I just want to uh, learn your take on AI and drug discoveries. And what do you think, uh, not only for the whole industry, but also for the CNS? Um, AI, you know, is a new world. I, you know, one couple years ago, you know, I have friends here to invest in tech and cover AI. So, you know, it's okay, I, I take the data, I went to some, you know, page, and then people show me, and oh, this is how you model. This thing is not new. We used, we didn't call it AI before, because, you know, it, we call it artificial new network. Uh, you know, that's something I played like 20 years ago in, in college. And by the time, we don't have, you know, the, the, the computer power. We don't have data. Uh, so AI, AI I think, it's, you know, it's a good time. And then, but the first question is, you know, I think AI have a lot of application for sure, and especially in biotech in some area, like you know, who has it before uh, working on AI and the pathology I and imaging. AI, yeah, I think that one, you know, I, I think that's a real area. But right now, I think people talk about use AI to drug discovery. Uh, I, I, I'm, my personal opinion is, you know, that's a problem for a lot of people. I think it's more high. Uh, then it can be more. Uh, and I, I think the reason is real. I mean, for anyone know, uh, in data science, there's you know the thing is you know, garbage in, garbage out. And the, the biggest problem we have in biotech is we don't really have a lot of very reliable data. That's a fact. You know, I just give one example. You know, a lot of air comes here. You know, where did it come from? You know, most companies don't do have internal R&D. Oh, I get the data from the publications. But the problem, you know, if you look at the publication, I think it's well known in the in the in the in the industry, you know, uh, forty to fifty percent of the data from the publication can't be, you know, replicated. You can't even really repeat it. So that means that's really garbage. So I don't know, you know, what result gonna be, but just on high level, I think we are far from being being able to really use AI potential in the drug discovery until we have really, you know, reliable data to can support in the train the data. Okay, so uh, 
I didn't introduce the person that ran us to you, and um, he is working on the fourth generation sequencing technology, and where people are talking about data and try to address the issue of garbage in and garbage out, as <laughs> I <laughs> just mentioned earlier. So um, in in the past 30 years, actually early this year, in March, people. Scientists just published the first complete human genome with no gap in no no gap in the in the whole genome at all. That is, it takes 30 years, about three billion dollars to finish that. And um, uh, Dr. Joe's company is actually their vision is to produce a whole genome sequencing with a hundred dollars within several hours. So what I want to learn, uh, I hope you can share with the audience, is that how do you think the sequencing subsectors have impact on drug discoveries and on patient experience and how you can control the better quality too? Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, as, so as uh, Dr. Wang has said, uh, the data quality is the one huge concern for our days. And our company, our mission, I think, just try to provide data with high quality and uh, with low cost in a more timely way to, for the clients or the patients. So uh, we focus on the sequencing field. So our working, our, our working uh, principle is we use something called nanoform. You don't need to know the details of that. That today is not a good, good, good time to talk too much about the technique uh, details. But uh, the key point is using this kind of technique, we can we are able to acquire the uh, sequence of a DNA just from one single DNA molecule, and uh, you know in real time just uh, just just uh, we just start the sequencing process, and uh, at the same time the the, the, the sequence result will come out. Rather than like that. And uh, so when we talk about, uh, just uh, as uh, we mentioned, uh, 30 years ago we spent a uh, billion dollars and many years to sequence one human genome. And in our days, we have some new technique called next generation of uh, sequencing technology. It decreases the uh, cost of uh, genome sequencing from almost one billion to $1,000 at the year of 2015. But after that, the cost just kept more or less constant, no further dec uh, decrease. And if, I think we talk, we talk this question to many of our like, um, like, uh, like potential customers. They all mentioned that if we want to trigger the, just the, the market, everybody wants to use this technique. The, 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 the cost had to be decreased to the hundred of dollars level. So that's what our technology can provide. Just, just like, mm, we use some like chip with large scale, uh, large scale uh, integrated circuit, just to sequence like, millions or tens of millions of sequence at the same time, and uh, the cost is very low because the, the electrical current, basically the at the like, signal basis, we don't cost much. We don't need to use the progressive label. Get to uh, modify some, some molecule and the amount of our read, reading is really small, so the cost is very low. So, uh, so I think what we can bring to the sequence field is like, mm, like the previous technology it can cover only 90% of the human genome, the, 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 the luminar technology, 90%, or like around 10% of the information is missing. So, more importantly, the missing part of the information more, more related to the disease, and the more difficult to, 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 to get it for sure. And for use, uh, using the single molecule molecule uh, sequence technology, we are able to cover almost perfectly the entire human genome, and the data quality is very high. And uh, uh, we can cut the sequence time, the turnover time from one week to 20 hours. So that's a huge change, and the cost we can the cost from $1,000 to almost $100, that's all the big change. 
So I think everyone in our field, we, ex we expect that in the future, the, 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 the people, the, the human genome sequencing can be something like a really regular physical examination like that. So it can be used by everyone. And then we can provide a lot of first hand real data to the downstream pharmaceutical companies and researchers to use this information and uh, interpret this information for new drugs. In fact, I think we just talked about the data ownership issue in the pre previous panel. That is, the, I believe the data is owned by the patient or the uh, individual, so that you have to trade it to put on market through something like the decentralized uh, whatever technology. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think there will be some improvement between the data user and also the data owner. Or probably say two and uh, although although the data itself belongs to the patients the, the themselves, but uh, I think for genetic information we can decentralize that. And so we have the second layer, we have we know it's from one person, but we don't know the background of the person, we don't know who he is. So I think this kind of uh, actually, I'm always curious. Like, since we do have also blockchain experts, like I want, like say, uh, the, because of the, the biotech research, the data privacy and also ownership. So we do really expect that one day this blockchain can be really applied in the healthcare field. But we are really don't know which day, you know, that will really come. But it's going to be a definitely huge implication of the blockchain. So um, we can put this aside, maybe uh, we have discussions uh, after the panel, that is how we actually transform patient data to on the, um, on the uh, infrastructure that drug companies can use and they have the ownership too. Yeah, I think that's the second step. First step is how can we open the data? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, um, and uh, we're talking about touch upon of several trends. And I want to ask the same question to Anna about what do you think is the trend in the industry and also talk about how Hanhai Bell Lab actually facilitate the whole training issues and startups in the field. Yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, as an uh, investor, I do definitely see one investment trend also changed in the post-pandemic time. So historically, investors are more willing to invest a company after you have multiple meetings and in-person meetings make the final investment decision. Uh, but because of the pandemic, investors, including myself, at the first they were reluctant to accept the, the, the fact that this is the only way to meet the companies in a virtual way. Later, it turns out to be a really efficient. It's good for startup company, create a more um, opportunity for fundraising, and also good for um, VCs that have uh, good uh, um, access to deals all over the world. And some investors, they even look at the deal, look at use the Jones to look at the uh, uh, manufacturing facility over the, the sector. But of course, there are also investors um, prefer that because especially when you invest in early stage company, team are very, very important. You do really want to have also meeting with the company uh, or the CEO to see whether they do really have the feature and also character to uh, lead the team to succeed. So definitely the, the investment pattern I do see after pandemic is not a completely wide and uh, like a left and right, but it's going to be a hybrid way. This is the first thing. Um, second thing is collaboration. Um, we see during pandemic there is more global collaboration in like say clinical trial. We have the patients recruitment from all over the world. Um, and also the, the uh, many trials are uh, conducted in different sites. This is also a way to expertise to this uh, um, uh, clinical research. Um, and also we're talking about the, the collaboration between biotech and sec other sectors, for instance, like say medical imaging or also data processing. Also, like our other panelists mentioned about the AI's application, this is definitely the, the huge implication of uh, and also application of AI in healthcare to uh, continue. And everybody know um, this vaccine development was like became successful under one year, which was like a fantasy for scientists years ago, since the average development time and also approval time for vaccine was like more than five years. 
but because AI right now contribute a lot for this uh, drug target identification and also validation, so now we are able to screen this uh, virtual compound library that is composed of billions of molecules and also have this uh, drug target identification efficient time in a much shorter time. So this is definitely the first uh, thing. Um, and uh, uh, but of course, garbage in, garbage out is after one day. So there still have a lot of limitations. For instance, even though you do see a lot of startup company working on using this uh, AI to um, help to um, really find the target, but uh, um, how many of them, there are a lot of limitations. In for instance, whether they can really use to identify like the antibody drugs. So there's still a lot of uh, uh, unknown at this point. Um, my second thing is uh, AI applications and um, telemedicine. So pandemic really changed a lot in the policy. So um, uh, uh, it's really decreased the barrier, the entry barrier for a lot of uh, company jump to the field. So you do see many telemedicine company coming out during the whole pandemic time. But we also expect uh, after pandemic, the policy gonna be the regulation gonna be tightened, and many company gonna um, also um, die off. Uh, and also mentioned about this uh, decentralized um, clinical trial. This is definitely a future trend. So the key of this decentralized clinical trial is can really allow this uh, virtual visit for patients. So this can really help for this uh, patient's uh, uh, recruitment and also increase the patient's appearance. Um, so even though this is still a new sector, but this is definitely a field, especially if we can really solve this uh, data ownership, data privacy, security issue. Um, this is AI, but of course there's other technology. We all heard of a cell therapy gene therapy. Actually, CAR T, the cell therapy CAR T might be C field in um, biotech uh, in China that may at one point uh, um, succeed China because of its easy access to clinical trial in, in, in China. So if you're looking at this uh, increased rate of the, the, the number of the trials, um, it's, it's really quite impressive. Um, and also the, the 3D bioprinting, about the work on the cheap technology, and also precision medicine, those gonna all continue to thrive. So I have mentioned a lot of trends in the industry, and my question is, when you, an individual startup, talk to two weeks, how do you make decision? Yeah, so um, actually, uh, life, science, life science investors is Device is very different from other field. So, uh, as a device, being able to invest in the uh, biotech sector, you really need uh, deep domain knowledge and also uh, many years uh, uh, experience in the sector B, so that you will be able to understand the data and also science. Um, actually, I read, read a lot of the paper when uh, I uh, review the technology of the company. Um, so, so, so that is, uh, 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 but there's also, of course, share um, other uh, things, kind of like when you invest in other sector, for instance, product technologies, all they're very important. Um, so for biotech company, we spend a lot of time looking at the data, 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 everything is about data. But for medtech company and also device company, we need to also encourage company to really need to spend time doing the market fit. Um, actually, you will be surprised, especially for a lot of uh, a company, they spend a lot of money and also time working on the working on the product before they even talk to the um, uh, physicians in hospital. Whether it is possible uh, to be used in hospital. Actually, um, I'm now doing accelerator. I'm the founder of Accelerator Healthcare Accelerator, um, and we are providing all this commercialization uh, service, uh, acceleration service to early stage company. Um, now we have 18 mentors, and uh, um, most of our mentors um, are uh, physicians and also, of course, investors, and they are really helping company for this market fit. So product technology is one thing, and also, of course, patent. Patent is also an issue in the biotech for this patent, is especially common compared to other sectors. Um, actually, many companies, their technology are seen out from university, and they really have issue for their patent ownership. We see way too many cases like that. But for the company, if you really have good technology, we are really able to work together with you to figure that out. So technology, patent, um, product. And the second part is the, the team. So we want the CEO to be really sophisticated, to really not only to give the direction to the company, being very flexible, be able to pivot the company in tough time, for instance, like a pandemic time. 
um, and also to really um, set up great company culture um, and also have a great network for the business partnership and team recruitment uh, and also fundraising. Um, and also just another part is um, you really, um, as a team, it's totally okay to miss one key player in the, in the team. Um, it, you'd rather just miss one person rather than put a inappropriate person in the position. Um, another part is um, a lot of company they, 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 they don't really know before they start doing fundraising the reason whether they are the finan financial investor or they are the strategic investor. Um, so those are all like different uh, different things to consider. So what I think as an entrepreneur is uh, Ella mentioned that they have a physician network. I think from, from my point of view, it's really essential for startups at the very beginning for the product development to talk with physicians. And with that, we actually talk with another Bay Area startup who are, doing the, for, for, who are providing physician networks. And they charge 10000 for a session. So you can talk with her to save you $10,000 per week. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and um, I have um, I thought several questions to follow up from all three of you. Is that um, traditionally, and I, I think Tao also mentioned that traditionally all the precision medicine, all the digitalization data is about oncology. And right now the trend is moving beyond oncology. And also the trend is people who are talking about data is EMR data or uh, genome sequencing data and how we actually move beyond EMR and uh, uh, DNA sequencing. So um, we see basically what do you think the trend to move from oncology and sequencing and apply to a broad, broader application? I think beyond the, 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 the uh, first thing we need to um, obtain the comprehensive, comprehensive uh, data, not just the oncology, but uh, everything else. That's the first thing. And beyond that, I think the, I think currently we still cannot build a very good connection between the data, between the like, the data to the particular disease. So, 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 some, some, when, when we talk to some friends, some of them get a question, oh, what, 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 what kind of benefit it has to do the sequencing? And my, my, my genetic uh, information, so what? You tell me, oh, my family from what, blah, 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 I have some, like, uh, maybe I have some higher risk to develop some kind of that things, blah, 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 blah. But, but what can I do? So I think I think for for genetic information to have its real application, we for this then we need to uh, just have a good way to interpret that to build a connection that with some either therapy or or uh, the, 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 the uh, disease risk something like that. Uh, we right now we have some uh, successful example just like uh, for some like uh, drug uh, target the drug. So some kind of gene type to have it will be very effective, but for some but also maybe not effective. So you don't get to do that drug and don't need to waste money and you can find some better way. And since that, that's that's one one small example, but right now I think beyond the data mining, I think like data query, we need to uh, just interpret them. So I think right now we have some like, power to uh, just to try to build a connection between disease and, uh, and the uh, second data. So just, uh, just my, my point of view is like, if, so we have, we, we have one step forward and say, oh, you that you can have some benefit, and it's kind of cheap. So why not just uh, to pay to get the more information? And then more people to do the second thing and more data is available, and then we have the AI, we have the, like, uh, the data, the big data, like science, 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 something like that, informa information technology, we can get, get, utilize the data to have some like, more valuable information, and then that can make the data itself more valuable, and then the patient will be more willing to do the same thing, and then more data will come, come in, and then 
it will just just get more more valuable information. I think it is kind of a positive uh, feedback. So 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 on one hand we have more real data, and on the other hand the data is not just like a message, like sem semi relevant. Nobody knows what can you do with the data. So these two aspects we put them together, and then that can we can we can we can get into a new the stage we can really use the use the data to uh, help the like, uh, medical industry. Yeah, um, uh, quick point. Uh, so I think in the whole scope point, I think we can learn a lot from success in oncology. And if I think about the reflecting on you know, uh, past 20, 30 years, I've seen oncology. I think that's probably three things make it very, you know, very unique. One is, you know, since the 1890s, uh, we have all tools to study biology. That's, you know, uh, modern biology, right? And then uh, I think the second one is, you know, how we maintain the gene, you know, at the time we have gene knockout, the big thing. And the third thing is the model, you know, we have the general model. I think that's three things probably among other things, uh, also have the genome synthesis, except greatly the oncology study. I think right now in science, we probably see the same thing we can, uh, we can learn. For example, uh, on the model side, you know, uh, like we are doing human, you know, uh, neuron ID derived, that's one thing. And then we have you know, technology for quiz work, for example, that's going to settle a lot, but it work, it work. And then the second is uh, the, the genomics. You know, now we can do single cell sequencing. That's it, become a routine. And then we can, uh, another thing that's on the two side is the imaging technology. We can really do high condition, very really fast, very cheap, a lot of data. And then this eventually going to accelerate the, the neuroscience. That's what I've seen in the oncology and just, well, This, I think, is the trend in neuroscience. We can learn from oncology. So this is what we should be focused on industry to, to, to make sure we can get enough data and support really just So definitely the, the trend to convert from this oncology or rareness sometimes into this more prevalent prevalent meaning could be, let's say, cardiovascular problem or diabetes or obesity, hypertension. It's definitely the future um, trend. So now when you look at, for instance, all this uh, gene therapy, so most of the gene therapy, especially those you can see will be approved uh, or was approved uh, in the recent two years, are all in the severe diseases. But we do really expect in the next five years, actually this is what we already started to uh, focus on our ES application in the uh, prevalent diseases. But also it has, of course, its limitation. For instance, for type 2 diabetes, um, uh, actually the incidence is caused to contributed by two factors equally. One is by genetic fact, uh, factor, 50%, and the other 50% are completely contributed by the lifestyle. And also, it's not really caused by single genes. It could be your liver, it could be your fat, it could be your muscle. It's all the issues. So, of course, there's a lot of limitations for what technology, what diseases, what technology can be used in what diseases. There are definitely um, some um, uh, 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 limitation. Uh, but there's also why uh, in the recent, starting from 10 years ago, let's like say microbiome, the research in microbiome become more and more popular since that is a way to uh, really looking at your whole body, how the microbiome, how for instance certain lifestyle intervention or some intervention can really make an impact your body. It's not from like changing one gene, but it's really a cause the uh, issue of your whole gut. Um, actually, I was uh, chatting uh, with, uh, 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 we have a group for our accelerator, and we were chatting about uh, uh, when I did my post out. Um, one of my projects was to look at whether some exercise beneficial effects are from, from microbiome or your, your gut, all those, all those uh, bacteria group. So what um, I did was just like transfer fecal, uh, like stool, for example. Um, from some exercise mice into some germ-free mice. The germ-free mice will separate them into the, um, uh, let's say, the lean and also the obese um, uh, obese group, and then to see uh, whether it can become, you know, those receiving mice could receive, you know, show, demonstrate some exercise beneficial effect. And the first time results was great. <laughs> It was not able to replicate it, unfortunately. But, um, but this is definitely the future trend. Actually, a lot of um, oncology study, they are now uh, uh, really focusing on this, uh, the, the whole body metabolism. So that's definitely the future trend. That, that, that reminds me, um, 
the uh, transplant of the uh, microbiome to actually treat uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So um, I think I um, from from that I think five years from now, if I have another chance to hold a panel and when I ask my audience whether they're so disappointed with the R and D productivity for therapeutics, I hope that time. I got some of the people raised their hand saying that it's good. I don't want to complain <laughs> anyone. Thank you.